Hey everyone, and welcome to this lecture. The focus will be on what is called medieval theology. So we've spent some time looking at the patristic church, uh, the, the time kind of right after um, the early church in Acts, and it's a time when the church was beginning to fortify some of their beliefs and, and think about what it is they, they believe. We talked about how the philosophical tools that got used were was really Platonism and Neoplatonism. Um, and we talked about how they began to refine some of their beliefs about the Incarnation and the Trinity and some of those doctrinal uh, beliefs. We also spent quite a bit of time looking at Augustine um, and using him as this um, example or representative of the patristic period. Now, interestingly, Augustine is often thought of as kind of this person who bridges both the, the patristic and the medieval. And Augustine is going to have this um, influence on even people like Aquinas and others. And so it's not as though Augustine disappears. He's going to be influential in medieval theology and then really reappear with Luther and, and Calvin. But there are going to be some significant differences here with the medieval period. And in particular, when we get to Thomas Aquinas uh, and begin exploring his use of Aristotle as a way to, uh, to do theology in, in the Middle Ages. Now, I think it's important that we establish a little bit of historical uh, context. So when you think about Europe during this time, um, what happens in the Middle Ages is the Roman Empire, as we know it, um, it fractures. And the empire in the West um, gets overrun and, and uh, overtaken by some of the northern tribes, the so-called barbarian tribes from the north that come in and, and they sack Rome and that western part of the empire falls. Interestingly, um, the empire in the east, um, it remains. It, it remains intact and it will remain intact kind of through the Middle Ages. And it will be helpful for us to think about that when we think about the first real split that's going to happen in Christianity during this, this time where the Western Church, the Roman Catholic Church, is going to split from the Eastern Orthodox Church. And we'll talk about what those issues are that causes the split. But I think it's important for us to, to recognize that uh, a big part of this split could simply be historical and geographical. That when we think about the fall of the West, uh, there's reason to, to then understand how the Roman Catholic Church or the Church in Rome becomes very prominent and powerful. Whereas in the East, uh, there's other churches that are, are there and they kind of have their own uh, life under the Eastern part of the empire. Now, during this time, there's also a shift in thinking about the relationship between the church and the state, uh, this idea of Christendom. Uh, we're going to see the contact with Islam and the rise of Islam and the interaction with Christianity and Islam through the Crusades. What we're also going to talk about are the developments in the liturgy uh, and the sacraments and really how Thomas Aquinas' theology uh, undergirds uh, much of, especially in the West, the Roman Catholic understanding of the liturgy and the Eucharist, and we'll, we'll talk about that. We'll talk about some of the doctrinal developments um, uh, as well, some of the things around icons and the Eucharist uh, and the development of the sacramental system uh, in the Western Church. Now, um, one of the ways, as I said, to think about the split between the East and the West is to think about um, the, the split geographically in the Roman Empire. When the Western part falls, um, there's one church in the West that can trace its lineage back to an apostle, and that is Rome. Uh, and so if we think about uh, this idea of of Peter being first among brothers, like the the papacy or the Bishop of Rome having this um, significant role in the church, 
both the East and the West would agree with the primacy of Peter and see Peter as first among brothers. Now, what ends up happening in the West is there's a, uh, an emphasis upon the first part, that Peter is uh, the leader. And in the East, what you get is an emphasis upon the brothers part, that yes, Peter is the one who Jesus kind of gave the keys to the kingdom to, but it's the apostolic authority that is really the emphasis here. And when the West falls and you kind of draw a line between East and West and you realize that Rome is kind of on its own island and is left to uh, kind of pick up some of the pieces of the Western Empire that has fallen, and then you see on the in the eastern part that there's all of these other churches that can trace their lineage back to uh, an apostle, um, and you get that brothers emphasis. You can begin to see how the the um, differences between the western and eastern church are going to develop. Uh, one of them in the west, it's going to be much more legally focused, kind of legal minded. Uh, whereas the Eastern Empire is going to be much more philosophically minded. And we'll see that play out as the church in the West kind of feels the need to explain everything. How do we come up with doctrinal positions on this and that and the other thing? Now, it's interesting that the Reformation happens in the Western church, not the Eastern church. And so the Reformation is going to inherit, the Reformers are going to inherit some of those tendencies in the West to want to explain a lot of things through doctrine. Um, and we can see that in, in Protestantism. Now, one of the first itch issues or controversies that I think is important to bring up uh, in the Middle Ages is the iconoclastic controversy, which actually happens in the eastern part of the church. And it, it's a question about icons. Are icons a form of idolatry? Now, what are icons? Icons are these two-dimensional paintings that are seen not just as a picture or a painting, uh, but when you think kind of platonically, this idea of participation, that somehow that painting participates in the reality of the person it depicts, icons were being used in the worship of the Eastern Church. So if you've ever been to an Eastern Orthodox Church, uh, you'll see that they have these paintings um, on the walls, uh, on the in the front, and these are uh, more than symbols. They are a representation of the presence of the people that the, the the icons signify. And so again, you have to think about icons in the sense of moving through the icon to that thing which is represented. Well, in the Eastern Church around 725, you know, to 842, they were having this discussion about icons and idolatry. Are icons a form of idolatry? Now, there were some in the East who were saying yes. Now, where did this come from? Historically speaking, it is the, the question of the relationship between the contact with the Muslim world, which is very iconoclastic. Uh, we do not represent God. They do not repre even represent um, Muhammad. And so when you think about the beginning of the interaction between Christianity and Muslims, and if you think about how the Eastern Church is situated right on the, the, at the place where this meeting is, is going to take place, where Islam is spreading uh, in some of the, the places in the East, you can see how some of those beliefs might influence uh, the Eastern Church. But more than that, it was a question of, you know, can the, the the divine be inscribed in an image? Can the divinity of Jesus be inscribed in an image? And it goes back to um, the Ten Commandments to not make a graven image. And so you had some people who were saying, yes, it is a form of idolatry. And in fact, um, they began to take out the icons and paint over the icons in the churches as a way to kind of, you know, purify uh, the church. But then you get a group of people who say no. And what they want to do is differentiate between worship of God and worship as veneration. And what that means is to worship someone as a god uh, or to worship God, the god, uh, versus kind of putting a poster up in your room. Like, we, we all do this. We've, we've got posters of sports figures or rock stars or whomever, or even maybe a picture of your dog or, 
uh, your boyfriend, girlfriend, or family. And what you're doing by putting that picture up is you're not worship, worshiping them as a deity. You are uh, venerating them as someone who is important. And so um, the response that many of these Christians had was that this is not the worship of you know people through these paintings. They're not worshiping the painting. Um, they're praying to God or they're praying to Jesus Christ through the icon. Uh, and and then when you think about the pictures of Mary and the apostles, there's a veneration that's happening. So it would be like we're putting, you know, Tom Brady or Michael Jordan posters up in our room. We're venerating who we think are the greatest athletes. They were venerating the heroes of the faith, which would you know be the apostles and the prophets and so on and so forth. And so this is the conflict that is beginning to take place. Uh, and in the end, the the icon uh, people went out. And so icons get reaffirmed. And to this day in the Eastern Church, you can see the use of these icons. Now, you might say, now, why does this matter? Well, what's interesting is this, this seems to be the, the, these kind of impulses that are going to come back in the Reformation. So especially when we think about certain Reformed um, expressions of Christianity, there was um, a removal of paintings and statues and and uh, even organs and musical instruments as a way to simplify worship. And it goes back to this idea that uh, we, we shouldn't make images. And just to give you a little bit of understanding, I'm going to read from John of Damascus, who was one at the time who was really pushing back against the um, uh, getting rid of, of icons. Like he was very supportive of icons. And so I just want to uh, read this with you here a minute. He says, uh, who first made images? God himself begat his only begotten son and word, his living and natural image, the exact imprint of his eternity. He then made humankind in accordance with the same image and likeness. And Adam saw God and heard the sound of his feet, and he walked in the evening, and he hid himself in paradise. And Jacob saw and wrestled with God. It is clear that God appeared to him as a man, and Moses saw him as a human back and Isaiah saw as a man seated on a throne and Daniel saw the likeness of a man and the son of man coming upon the ancient of days. No one, however, saw the nature of God, but the figure and image of one who was yet to come for the invisible son and word of God was about to become truly human. So what John of Damascus is doing is he's focusing on the incarnation. God became a human being. So when we think about who created the image? Who first made images? That's his question. He's saying God is the one who made images and God revealed God's self in the human person, Jesus Christ. And therefore, it is okay to depict Jesus uh, and, and the apostles and everyone else in um, icons and images. Um and he goes on to say, should I not therefore make an image of the one who appeared for my sake in the nature of flesh and venerate and honor him with the honor and veneration offered to his image? Abraham did not see God's nature, for no one has ever seen God, but the image of God uh, and falling down, he venerated him. And then Jesus, actually, this is Joshua, the son of Nave, did not see the nature of an angel, but its image. Um, and, and so, again, he's he's saying um, God became a human being and uh, angels have come and, and he's using the idea of veneration, like the difference between Joshua falling down before the angel um, a, and emphasizing, again, there's a difference between venerating and worshiping. But in the case of Jesus Christ, it is the revelation of God uh, in human form. And so therefore, we can make images and icons are okay. Uh, and the iconography of the Eastern Church is a way of of getting at this idea. Now, I would argue we're not far off from this in our own culture. So, um, if I were to bring uh, an you know an American flag into the classroom and burn it without kind of explaining, people are going to be upset with me. And to which I would simply say, "What are you talking about? It's just a piece of cloth with dye on it." Um, but it's not. It's more than that. Uh, in the 
1990s, Sinead O'Connor on Saturday Night Live ripped a picture of Pope John Paul II after she got done singing um, and in kind of protest of, of the Catholic Church. And it ended her career. Um, again, we could say it's just a picture, but, you know, is it just a picture when you make these moves? And so when you think about an icon, what we have is these two-dimensional paintings that are done in a way to get you to not stop at the actual painting. So this is an icon of John the Baptist. And the idea here is that um, you don't stop at the painting of John the Baptist. You move through the painting of John the Baptist to venerate that which the painting signifies or represents. Again, this idea that the icon participates in the reality of the person that it represents. So idolatry is when you stop and don't actually get to the thing that it represents. Now, again, for us to really get in, into the understanding of this, we have to put ourselves into that kind of platonic worldview of the participation of things of, uh, in signs and so on. So pictures participating in the reality. I think we talked about tree and treeness. Um, you know, the, the tree participates in treeness. Uh, and here, the idea would be that John the Baptist is participating in the reality of the painting. So when you go into an Eastern Orthodox church, what you would find is they will have an icon of the, the saint that the church represents or, or that the church is named after, and they'll bend down and they'll kiss it. Uh, that's strange to many of us who are Protestants, but what they're actually doing is believe that they are greeting the person that the painting represents. They're moving through that painting to the person that it represents. And now you find this in the the, the um, Roman Catholic Church as well, but for them it's not as much uh, paintings or I painting is or icons more as statues. There's many more statues in the West than in the in the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, there is art and so on and so forth, and the iconography is that which is found in the uh, in the Eastern Church. But there's still that same idea. Uh, you go into a Catholic church, you see a crucifix up in the front, you see Jesus depicted. The idea is we can depict Jesus because this is the way that God has revealed God's self in human form. Therefore, it is not uh, a form of idolatry. So that first uh, issue is the iconoclastic controversy. The second one that I want to talk about is the beginning of the Eucharistic controversy. So the question is, when we say that Christ is present in the bread and the wine, this is my body and this is my blood, the question is, how is it the body and blood of Jesus? And so what developed around the 8th and 9th century is a disagreement about the relationship between the bread and the wine and the body and blood of Christ. Uh, there was even this discussion about the Eucharist as a sacrifice. So as we think about the East and the West, both the Orthodox and the Catholic churches, for those of us who are Protestant, you know, our church, well, today, most of our churches have like praise teams and things like that. We don't even have like the table up in front anymore. But the imagery in a Protestant church, Lutheran, Reformed, whatever, it used to be, there'd be a pulpit, there'd be a table, there'd be a font for baptism. And we call it a table, not an altar, because we talk about the Lord's Supper. And we, we think about how uh, at the Lord's Supper, Jesus said, this is my body, this is my blood. Um, whereas in the Catholic Church and the Orthodox Church, what you find at the front is it's called an altar. Because there's a sense that what, what's happening is the sacrifice of Christ. Now, today we would say, and Catholics and Orthodox would say, that what's, what's being made present is the one sacrifice of Christ. We're not re-sacrificing Jesus. That was one of the issues that the Reformers um, really wrestled with and, and argued with the, the Catholic Church about, for example. Um, but that question of... You know, are we making present again the, the true sacrifice of Christ? And if we are making that present, is the bread and the wine the body and blood of Christ? Um, and so what you have are a couple of different uh, people. Pascus, Red Burtis, early on, uh, writes this treatise on the body and blood of our Lord, where he is saying after consecration, in other words, when the priest says, um, goes through the formula of, of saying on the night that he was betrayed and, and so on, holds up the Eucharist 
it, it becomes the body and blood of Christ, that it, the, the bread and the wine truly are the body and blood of Christ. Another guy named Ra- Rachmanus um, made the argument that the bread and the wine simply remain the bread and the wine, that the presence is figurative. Uh, and he made the argument based upon the idea that in Acts, we say that the, the, the body of Christ now sits at the right hand of the Father. Uh, and so, therefore, uh, what we're eating is bread and, and drinking wine, and it's not the real body and blood of Jesus. And so this created a, a disagreement. What is going on when we partake of the sacrament uh, or the Eucharist? Uh, so a bishop, uh, Haimo of Halberstadt, comes along and emphasizes what he calls the substantial transformation of the bread and the wine into the body and blood of Christ. And so he begins to develop this idea that at, at the consecration, what happens is the bread and the wine become the actual body and blood of Jesus Christ. Now, why does this matter? This is going to repeat itself later on in uh, in the Middle Ages, closer to the Reformation, uh, as we think about the nature of the sacraments. What are the sacraments, and what do they do, and how do they uh, how do they function? And so we see the impulse of some of the Reformation stuff here. That there are, is the argument that uh, it's bread and wine. It's not the the actual body and blood of Jesus. And we'll see how this becomes a source of tension between the church in the West and the Reformation. Now, it's not a source of tension between the church in the West and the church in the East. The Orthodox and the Catholic Church both believe that the bread and the wine are the body and blood of um, of Jesus Christ. Uh, now, what's different in the East is that they don't necessarily hold to what is called transubstantiation. And we'll talk about that later and unpack it. It's a, it's a way of using Aristotle's philosophy to explain how the bread and the wine become the body and blood of Jesus. So again, I said to you earlier, the emphasis in the West is explaining, like, how does this happen? Can we use philosophy to, to kind of figure this out and support uh, biblical and theological beliefs? In the East, there's much more of a sense of it's a mystery. We don't know how it works. Just take it. Um, But they do believe that it is the body and blood of Jesus Christ. So these are some of the, a couple of the early controversies. And then we we get what is called the the filioque controversy. And this is going to further uh, kind of uh, become one of the ingredients that really causes the split between the Eastern and the Western church. So what is this controversy about? Well, uh, in the Nicene Creed, there is a part that comes from actually the Constantinopolitan Creed that is about the Holy Spirit. So if you remember, the Nicene Creed is about the person of Jesus Christ who is begotten, not made. And then the Constantinopolitan part gets added in at the end to create this creed where they talk about the Holy Spirit. And, And it says that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father. So the Son is begotten and the Holy Spirit proceeds. What happens in the West is they they add this little piece to the Holy Spirit part where it says that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. This is what filioque means, the Son. And so you get the double procession uh, of the Holy Spirit. So in the East, they hold to the original version of the creed, which says that the the Spirit proceeds. Now, what they would say is that the Spirit proceeds from the Father through the Son. In other words, the Father is seen as the origin, the begetting of the Son and the procession of the Spirit. And the Spirit and the Son are related to one another as it proceeds through the Son, but the Spirit doesn't originate with the Son. And in the West, that the addition of the filioque part is saying that the, 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 the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. So you might, we might say, what does it matter? Well, back in the day, it mattered a lot. Um, there's a sense in which, uh, you know, first of all, who, who do you think you are that you get to change the creed? You just get to add this little piece to it. 
Uh, and to this day, there is tension between the East and the West on this. So when they get together, when, when Pope Francis or whoever the Pope is gets together with the patriarch uh, wherever and they're going to worship together, they have to make a decision on what form of the creed they're going to use. And it creates this tension. The question of the of the Trinity, um, you know, and the oneness of God. Is there a sense in which the filioque creates uh, a two-ness, that there's two sources, um, you know, kind of creating this dyad of the Father and the Son, and then, you know, the Spirit comes through both of them. Um, now, in, in the West, I think what Augustine especially was beginning to say is that the Spirit is the relation of the Father and the Son. And so, again, if you think about it in those terms, there has to be kind of this procession of love that is coming from uh, both the Father and the Son. But in the East, there was such an emphasis upon maintaining the original creed. So the question of why this matters has to do with doctrine and doctrinal beliefs about who we believe God is and what the Nicene Creed had established and who has the authority to kind of change the creed whenever they, uh, you know, feel like it. Um, now, what ends up happening is both sides are going to declare each other heretical, and this is going to be one of the things that uh, really becomes a splinter between the church in the West and the church in the East, and it still is. Um, it still is this question of, of procession and, and so on. So in 1054, we get the schism. Uh, and so when we think about the Reformation, we often think the Reformation is this big split within the church. Well, the, the, the first split, um, big split came in 1054. And this is between the Eastern and the Western church. Now, where does the split come from? the tension over the issue of papal authority. As I already mentioned, there's political and cultural tension. Um, you know, the, the difference between the Latin West that wants to put an emphasis upon legal things and kind of uh, create doctrine and explain everything and the, and the more philosophical Greek East that is much more open to mystery and mysticism and things like that. But then the Filioque controversy comes in, into play. Um, the question of the celibacy of priests. So uh, in the Eastern Church, priests can get married. Uh, in the Western Church, they, they can't. Now, in the East, you can't rise up to become a bishop or a patriarch and, and be married, but you can be a priest. The question of the primacy of Rome versus the brotherhood of the apostolic churches. We talked about this. Believe it or not, it was beards or no beards. In the West, they were clean shaven. In the East, they had beards. And then, as I said, the political and cultural differences. All of this culminates in July 16, 1054. The Catholic Cardinal places a bull of excommunication, this announcement of excommunication um, against the, the patriarch of Constantinople. And they end up excommunicating each other. Uh, and that split still remains between the Eastern and the Western Church. There's been some dialogue and so on, but um, there still is that split. So now let's shift gears a little bit and let's talk about um, the rise of what is called scholastic theology. So what is scholastic theology? Scholastic theology uh, is the beginning of rational justification for religious beliefs. So what we're going to begin to see in the Middle Ages is the rise of the university and an emphasis upon being able to use reason to not get to faith, you can't use reason to get to God, but we can use reason as a scaffolding to make sense of the world and support our beliefs. So Anselm of Canterbury will talk about faith seeking understanding, and all of this gives rise to the universities and the liberal arts. So when we think about college today and learning today, much of it flows out of a system that was grounded in the church, in the monastic life of the church, that starts here with scholasticism. Uh, and so we're going to see this with a guy named Anselm of Canterbury, whom I already mentioned. He, he lived about 1033 to 1109. And there are two primary things that he is going to focus on. Um, 
Number one, we're going to talk about the ontological argument for God's existence. And the only reason I, I talk about this with you is because I think it's important to recognize how reason gets used to try to support uh, faith and support beliefs. But then more importantly, we're going to get into talking about the satisfaction theory of the atonement. And this uh, has important consequences for how we think about the work of Christ. It establishes a view of Christ's work in the Middle Ages and a, a, a view of the sacraments, the development of the sacramental system, uh, and also then um, a way of thinking about purgatory and, and how to make sense of purgatory. Um, but it will also then play a role as we think about the Reformation and how the Reformers' view of the atonement uh, maybe accept certain view uh, aspects of the satisfaction theory, but uh, pushes back against some others and develops other ways of, of thinking uh, about the atonement. And so that's where we'll pick up next time. We'll pick up with Anselm of Canterbury. We'll try to prove uh, the existence of God. Uh, and then we will talk about how he understood the work of Jesus Christ. 